So now let's sort of take a small survey of some of the major issues, definitions, concepts in the battle for integration. Because that's essentially the definition of your life today, tomorrow, a billion years from now. And God designed it that way. Okay? And the integration wise, and also recently in the last couple of increments, we discover why. God wants to use His Godness to reach down and continually struggle with bringing non-God up to His level. First, it's truth be free. Otherwise, He doesn't even want to be God. And He throws Himself down before it. That's Psalm 138 too. So that kind of tells you everything about the heart of God, as it were. Why does God want to be God? And what does He do with His Godness? Well, there you go. He creates truth that is free, and then He falls down before it, continually. So the struggle upward, as it were, in God's own eyes, is to create and preserve truth be free. That's an upward. He, you know, it's like, you know, what is, what, the theologians have debated this for years, okay? What motivates God? And the problem with that question that they've all had is that they, well, see, God is self-existing, God is self-creating, God is self-everything. Actually, he didn't even create himself. So the idea of motivate implies that something has power or influence over you. And therefore, theologians, especially the Calvinists, have had trouble saying that anything can motivate God. Okay, but what they're missing is because he's sovereign, he can create his own motives. And then, as it were, almost not necessarily passively, but responsively, worship, hold together, support his own creation. And we all actually do that. That's one of the many ways that we are made in the image of God. You exist, and you didn't cause your own existence, but now you're here, you're self-determinative. So one of the functions of self-determination is to decide, well, I like this, I like that. And then you support what you like. You, as it were, serve what you like. But you're the one who ruled on what ought to be liked. Okay? Like, you choose Joe Blow as your friend or Jane Doe as your spouse or a presidential candidate or dinner and after you make that choice you support your choice and if you're tired of supporting it or you find something you don't like about it you change your mind well theoretically God could do that too but he knows everything to start with he's determining out of his own omniscience which of course he also creates what he's going to support and how and we know his choices truth be free and then as it were he responsibly worships his own choice because that's psalm 138 too when it's saying puts truth above his own name and that's the correct translation the king james happens to have that verse right and so do some others if he's putting something above himself that's a type of worship definitely love but when you're putting something above that means you're putting it on a pedestal that means you're making it higher and more valuable than you and that's what he's doing and he is giving his all to it and if you know that about God then you never have to worry about anything that's his heart that's what he chose to do and he could change his mind at any time but he won't. That's a greater assurance than if you had some kind of contract. Contracts are made to be broken. 
The only purpose of a contract, really, is a statement of intent. I mean, the, the real f fact of it is, okay, it's a statement of intent. And yeah, you can take somebody to court over breaking a contract, but if they don't fulfill it, they don't fulfill it. What are you going to do? Okay? The Bible is a series of contracts. I do contract law for a living. I guess that's why it's so easy for me to understand. But, you know, it's a series of contracts. It's a series of contracts. It's a series of depositions. It's a series of, as it were, narratives to tie the deposition to the contract to show in, in, in law, this is really important, to show why a law is written because the actual words of the law bring up all kinds of questions and function. So you have to look at why the law is written in order to be able to interpret the words that are written. This is how we go about in our governments. You know, like the debate that we're having now in the presidential election. Some of it concerns, you know, words in the Constitution. And you have to go back to why are those words in the Constitution in order to interpret the words that are in the Constitution. Such as, you know, what I think is a needless debate over what constitutes a natural-born U.S. citizen. It's a necessary debate. But to me, they should have fixed it long ago. Okay? They didn't. And, you know, in the last 20 years or so, we've had a spate of people who are not born inside the United States, but had one or more, both parents, U.S. citizens at the time. So are they eligible to run for president or not? That's a constitutional issue. And in order to understand how to interpret the words in the Constitution, natural born citizen, you have to go to what the framers meant by what they said and what the debates were since back in 1776. Well, it's the same thing with the Bible. When God says, thou shalt, what does he mean by that? And so you've got all this narrative in the, in the Bible to explain what he means by that. You know, if Christ says something that's not in the Ten Commandments exactly as he says it. Matthew 4.4, 4, you will not live only on bread, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now he's quoting Deuteronomy 8.3 when he says that. But Deuteronomy 8.3 itself is in a context. So to know what Christ means by what he said, which is actually an update on Deuteronomy 8.3, you have to go back to Deuteronomy 8.3. You have to go back to all the things that God said in Deuteronomy and Exodus and Leviticus and afterwards, because Christ is saying it thousands of years later, to know what Christ means by it. And he's updating the law. This is how lawyers work. This is what law is. And you're in training to be the lawgiver. That's what lawyer means. The king is the lawgiver. That's what you're in training to do. So you're in a constant battle of integration. Okay? And that battle, as I said in the last increment, you start with zero. You're supposed to get to the same kind of motives and understanding and thought connections as God has and he builds them in you. Because how else is it going to happen? You don't know what those connections are. He has to create them. But he knows what they are. And then you see things through his eyes. And it's still a battle. It's a battle for God. Now, this is the most important thing to say in this increment. It's a battle for God. That's kind of where I left it in the last increment. It's a battle God created. It's a battle God chose. It's a battle God decreed and throws himself down forever to serve it. So he's serving the freedom of truth by throwing himself down to an end-ending struggle because truth is full spectrum from the lower left corner to upper right corner. And he wants that struggle. Just because. Now I don't share his enjoyment of that. I can tell you what it is. And every day it's a struggle for me to even want to do this. Now that I finally, after what is it, 40 years of knowingly being a Christian, I'm 
been a believer since I was like five. But I didn't know about it until I was 18. As far as I know, I was a believer prior. You know, based on testimony of my mother. But, you know, as far as I knew, I had to decide, to believe in Christ and you're saved. And I knew that at 18, it was a real confrontational issue for me. I'm laying on my back in the bed and I'm looking at the ceiling and I'm talking to God and he's making a real issue of that in my head. So I did. I was a little stupid about it, but I did it. You can do something and be stupid or do it and be smart. I was stupid. Okay, so now, from 18 until 62, what is that? Okay, 44 years. I've been a believer. And I still don't enjoy the struggle. Maybe it's not enjoy in the sense of like. It's really, I mean, because the truth is that it's not likable. But you want to do it anyhow. And there you see the integrity because now the attraction or the enjoyment in the sense of pleasure. There's no pleasure in a thing you choose to do, but you do it because you ought to. You do it because it's right. You do it because you want to. You do it because it's beneficial. But the whole time you're doing it, you'd, lo you'd rather be doing something else. Well, who's to say that's not how it is for God? Why wouldn't it be that way for God? Why shouldn't it be that way for God? And if he's committing himself to unending struggle, obviously perfection does not mean what we all think it means. We think perfection is like everything in its place and everything works and everything's fine and everything feels good. Obviously that's not true. That's not the true definition of perfection. Because God is saddling himself with unending struggle because he's saddling himself with creation. We are always going to exist, whether in hell or heaven, and w in whatever, as it were, rank in society in hell or heaven. He chose that. He will always choose it. That's how he wants to be. That's the lifestyle he's chosen for himself. Father, Son, Spirit. They all choose this. And they're all in this unending struggle. And they're using the struggle to gift each other. Because what can God give to God but himself? And give to us. So he's giving himself to... They're giving themselves to each other and to us. And the idea is for us to learn to do the same thing. Back. And that's supposed to be the highest way to live. I have a lot of trouble agreeing with that. Satan has more trouble. But the battle of integration is the life. The struggle is the life. And there are a whole bunch of people down here. Especially if they've got a soldier mentality. Or a winner mentality. They like the struggle. They actually believe in it. They get, um, not exactly pleasure, but satisfaction from the struggle. I don't. So that's my character flaw. So they're ahead of me in those things. Maybe that's you too. You're ahead of me in that. But this is how God is. For sure. So a big goal in your life in integrating with God because you're supposed to be the integrator for your own kingdom in eternity. Everything's going to flow through you. Okay, God flows into you and then out from you flows to them because they don't want direct contact with him. Now they get it anyhow, but it sounds like it's like really small. You're trained to be the integrator. That's what kingship is. You're the embodiment of the kingdom. You're the walking repository of everything your kingdom stands for. That's the way it means that's what it means now, that's what it means in the eternal state. Except in the eternal state there's no sin. So you are constantly living your own battle. So what does it matter if nobody knows you now? That's actually better. Because you'll be public for eternity. So it's nice if you're hidden now. It's nice if you're not rich and famous now, because you're gonna be stuck with it for all eternity. 
And if you're stuck with being rich and famous now, I feel sorry for you, and I wish you the best. And God is using it to train you for a bigger rich and famous in eternity. And the difference between your fame, rich and fame now and your rich and fame then is then it will actually be enjoyable. You have moments where you enjoy it now, but it will always be enjoyable then. And for you, that's going to be a real source of satisfaction. If you're not yet rich and famous, or you don't become rich and famous in this life, you're going to be forever, and you're already rich and famous in heaven's eyes, because you're a son of Christ. Angels don't have that. There are millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of angels. And you're more famous than them. Right now. If only due to your potential. You're a potential king. That makes you famous. Just like, you know, the princes and the princesses that are on this earth right now. They might be stupid. They might be, you know, ridiculous. But their potential is for them to be a ruler. So then they're in, you know, the tabloids and everything else. For better and for worse. So that's a struggle too. Oh, I'm this wonderful person, but I feel like dog doo. I'm this wonderful person, but my circumstances are painful. Whether you're rich or poor, that's going to be true. Whether you're well or sick, that's going to be true. You have moments where things are nice, but they don't last long. And guess what? In heaven, it'll be the same. So if you were expecting heaven to be some kind of release or relief from the struggle, guess again. The difference is you like the struggle because God is living the struggle then and now by choice. So how do you learn to love the battle? Well, if you've got a soldier's mentality, if you like competing, if you like winning or trying to win, then you're ahead of the game. You understand this better than I do. But that's the kind of mindset you need to have. It's not solely that mindset. In other words, what's wrong with folks like Donald Trump is all they care about is winning. If they care about something else, they sure don't show it, and they never talk substance. There are a whole lot of people out there who just, they're, they're cutthroat. It's all win, win, win with them. And Satan's the same way. It, it, God's sense of this, of the desire to struggle and fight, is not simply to win. Win is just like a moment, but it's the process for him that he cares about. There was a cartoon years ago of a cat, big fat orange cat named Garfield that was a comic strip. And one of the one of the famous bumper sticker things that they made out of that com comic strip was Garfield, I think he's laying on his back, big fat stomach saying or saying it's not the it's not the having it's the getting okay with god it's that's it he's creator by nature that's how he chooses to be god he loves creating making 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 and then there's you know a finish and an achievement and a success and a win and oh and then we have our brief moment of celebration and then you go back to the same old same old and we live like that down here too I don't happen to like that style but maybe you do in which case you're ahead of me you're more advanced than I am on that topic good because that's how God is so think about, if you're not, you know, enjoying it that way, or if you are, even if you are, because there's always more to be gained, think about, or ask God, because this is what i got to do too, how do I enjoy the battle for integration? Because that's really what you, as God, choose as your own lifestyle. You, God the Father, you, God the Son, you, God the Holy Spirit, you're all choosing that as the way to live. 
when you don't have to. You just snap your fingers and everybody, anything, everything would be just, you know, with no struggle. Like he clearly doesn't want that. So why should we not want it? And Satan, of course, is busy saying, well, God doesn't want it because he's sadistic and masochistic. And you can see why Satan would say that. Okay, but obviously there's another answer. Okay, what's God's answer to that? Why does he enjoy the struggle? And as you find out from him why, I personally would really appreciate it if you'd stick your answers that you're getting in the comments or write me a personal, you know, mess, a private message or stick it in frame form. Because this is really kind of important. This is like your actual life. If I were to state in one phrase, what is your life? that is exactly like God's in his image battle for integration unending that doesn't sound attractive to me but it must be attractive because it's attractive to him why? peace out